despite the Allied landings in Sicily and the ever-increasing partisan problems in Croatia and in many of the other occupied territories, it was still the Eastern Front which was considered to be the biggest threat to the German army in 1944. The German High Command was certain of an upcoming Soviet winter offensive. At the start of 1944, the Soviet army fielded approximately 6 million soldiers. The Axis forces could muster just about 3 million soldiers on the Eastern Front. During the summer of 1943, the Soviet forces hadn't concentrated too much of their efforts on the northern part of the front. The Germans had therefore pulled a lot of its units out from the north to assist in other parts of the front where they were more needed. Some of these units were replaced with new and lesser units. Two of the new units were Luftwaffe units. These divisions had been given the task to defend against the uranium bound pocket, which would play a key role in the upcoming Soviet winter offensive. The Soviet Second Army had in all secrecy been transported to the uranium bound pocket. The Soviet Army would attack out of the pocket, and the 42nd Soviet Army would attack from the Leningrad area. The combined attack was meant to destroy the German 18th Army as well as advancing towards the Baltic states. When the Vision Northland arrived at the northern part of the front, it was given the task to hold the uranium bomb pocket. Alongside containing the Soviet pocket, the division was also tasked with defending the Estonian northern shore. When Division Northland arrived on the Eastern Front, it was quickly noted that the defense positions were in very bad shape. The units that had been stationed here earlier had lacked the sufficient training and experience to build strong fortifications. On the 10th of December 1943, all of Division Northland's personnel had reached its positions after leaving Croatia. Only six days after arriving at the new positions, General Felix Steiner, who was in charge of the division, urged the men to expand and improve their defensive positions. Every soldier and every officer is therefore obligated to take every preparation for the expected attack with the greatest patriotic and personal accountability. This is a battle of destiny. Luckily for Division Northland, the Soviets were still preparing for the offensive. The remaining half of December was spent on improving the defensive situation with help from civilians and a Straf battalion, a unit consisting of soldiers who had committed some kind of crime. At the end of December, reinforcements arrived in the form of SS Brigade in Nederland. The Panzer branch from Division Nordland would also arrive around the same time. The soldiers from SS Brigade in Nederland were only equipped with light weapons though, and the Panzer branch were yet to receive their promised tanks. So for the time being, the soldiers from Division Nordland had to make do with the 60 Panther tanks which had already been allocated to the front before Division Nordland arrived. These tanks suffered a lot of malfunctions though. Many of the tanks had to be dug into the ground so they could work as static anti-tank guns. Only about 30 of the Panther tanks were mobile. To sum it up, Division Nordland could muster 30 mobile Panthers, 30 Stumpyschutz, some 40 anti-tank guns, and the newly developed Panzerfaust, a handheld anti-panzer weapon. Ammunition was also scarce. Steiner therefore had to rely on his soldiers' battle morale. Steiner judged that the morale among the SS troops was high. The same could not be said about the two Luftwaffe divisions in the area. According to Steiner's evaluation, the upper management of the division is experienced and reliable but not completely cooperative. The lower management is tough and experienced. The fighting morale is high. With the current military training, the division is not ready for a major battle. Can withstand Panzer. The soldiers of Division Northland weren't only faced with the threat from the looming Soviet winter offensive. Much like in the Balkans, the occupied parts of the Soviet Union contained organized resistance. Soviet partisans, some simple civilians, some soldiers who had been encircled and later escaped into the wilderness to continue the fight against the Germans, were a threat not only for the units in the northern part of the Soviet Union, but for all the Axis forces on the Eastern Front. The partisans would target convoys and railways in order to disrupt the German supply lines 
and make it more difficult to send equipment and reinforcements to the front. Soldiers from Division Nordland therefore had to not only prepare against the Soviet offensive, but also hunt partisans in their rear. On the 21st of December, Nordland was ordered to send out two patrols alongside one patrol group from an SS police division to begin the hunt on partisans. It is not clear whether these patrols had any encounters with partisans, and in any case, every combat ready unit and soldier was required at the front because the Soviets were ready to attack. On the 14th of January, the Soviet 2nd Shock Army attacked out of the uranium bound pocket. The Soviet 42nd Army also attacked from the Leningrad area and all the way down to Novgorod, threatening the German units with encirclement. The two Luftwaffe divisions in the area were basically wiped out by the Soviet 2nd Shock Army. The situation for the German 18th Army was deteriorating fast. It was proposed to Hitler that the 18th Army should fall back to the Panther Line, but Hitler refused. Division Nordland had, by the 22nd of January, also been drawn into the Soviet attack. Regiment Denmark saw their first real action of the Soviet offensive on the 23rd and 24th of January, where the 1st Battalion came under heavy Soviet attack. On the 25th of January, the 1st Battalion could no longer resist the Soviet forces, which were now attacking from three sides. During the attack on the 1st Battalion of Regiment Denmark, the battalion lost their 1st and 2nd in command. SS Hauptsturmführer Per Sørensen took charge of the battalion, which at this point had been decimated to just 90 men and ordered a retreat. During the retreat, Per Sørensen would write the following letter to his parents in Denmark. In the last three weeks, we have experienced every type of attack imaginable. Panzer attacks, we withstood five, aerial attacks, and so on. I am yet again leading the battalion and we have acquired ideal recognition everywhere, also among our neighbors. The Reds have suffered terrible losses. We may also mourn the loss of good comrades, but that is the way of war. We had a march for eight days in the free air. That took the breath from the most hardened of us. The march, which lasted for eight days, described by Pier Sørensen, led the soldiers to Nava. The hasty retreat of the German 18th Army was aimed at the Luga River, where they would set up new defensive positions. But the fact is that the retreat was more like a general route. So when the 18th Army had reached the Luga River, it realized that the Soviet forces had already penetrated this new defensive line and created bridgeheads across the river. It was therefore decided to fall back to the Nava River where strong defensive positions would await them. At least, that is what most of the soldiers thought. The Panther Line would, according to the propaganda, be a defensive line full of bunkers, trenches, tank ditches and minefields, meant to slow down the Soviet advances and give the German soldiers breathing room. In reality, the work on Hitler's Ostwall had barely begun when the German forces reached the line. A leading officer in the so-called Kampfgruppe Küste described the Panther Line as followed. Despite Hitler's strict orders of no retreat, virtually nothing had been done to improve a defensive position. Some foxholes had been made east of Nava, and seemingly also some barbed wire. West of Nava, a plough had dug a 60 cm deep trench line along the river. At first, it didn't look as though the Panther Line could be held. Along the Nava Line, the Soviets managed to create two bridgeheads across the river, both north and south of the city Nava. Nava, with its railway line and highway to Tallinn, was the key into the Baltics. Due to the importance of Nava, Steiner had built a strong defensive line in front of the city, made up of Regiment Denmark, Brigade Nederland, and a squad of Tiger tanks. The Germans were able to destroy the Soviet bridgehead north of Nava with heavy casualties on both sides. 
The southern bridgehead was however not destroyed. The front did stabilize considerably after the Germans had destroyed the northern bridgehead. The fighting now turned into a bloody static war, which could remind one of the fighting during World War I. The Germans would manage to hold the Soviets on this front for no less than half a year. For Regiment Denmark, this meant that they would be mostly spared from heavy attacks by the Soviets. Even though Regiment Denmark would have a more peaceful period, the regiment had still lost much material. Much of the regiment's panzer and flak guns had been destroyed at this point. At the start of June, Regiment Denmark would yet again have to try to repel Soviet attacks. On the 12th of June, the 2nd Battalion of Regiment Denmark even had to fight harsh man-to-man -man battles. As most of the 7 Company's trenches fell to the Soviets, a young Danish Unterschaffführer led a counterattack which forced the Soviets back. This action was rewarded with the Iron Cross First Class and the Knight's Cross. Since the retreat from the uranium bound pocket, Division Nordland had had a tough time replenishing their 7,000 fallen soldiers. Division Nordland had to rely on survivors from the two Luftwaffe divisions that had virtually been destroyed during the Soviet winter offensive. Besides the soldiers returning from their injuries, new manpower to the division had been scarce. The division had therefore shrinked from some 12,500 soldiers in December 1943 to approximately 11,000 men in June 1944. When a new Soviet offensive was looming and the Germans were threatened south of Narva, it was decided in the middle of July to retreat 20 kilometers west to the Tannenberg line, where a significantly shorter front line awaited, which could be defended more easily. The retreat couldn't have fallen at any better time. The same morning as the vanguard was set to leave Narva, the Soviet offensive on Narva began. Narva, which at this point was no more than a ruin, had about 114 unharmed buildings left from its original 3,000, was left by the Germans, who made sure to burn and destroy any remaining lodgings or usable facilities. The Soviet forces would occupy the city on the 26th of July 1944. The new positions on the Tannenberg line consisted of three hills, which could be used to the defenders' advantage. Also, north and south from the Tannenberg line were swamps, this meant that sooner or later the Germans could expect a frontal attack from the Soviets. Amongst the units who were stationed forward were the 3rd Battalion of Regiment Denmark. Already the day after the soldiers of the 3rd Battalion had reached their new positions, the Soviet attack began. Against the German defenders, which could only muster a handful of divisions and only had a few working tanks in their positions, they were met by 11 Soviet divisions and hundreds of tanks. The ratio was 4 to 1 in the favor of the Soviets. The battle which lasted from the 26th of July to the 5th of August led to massive losses on both sides. But despite the huge numerical Soviet advantage, the soldiers from Division Nordland and Regiment Denmark and the 3rd Panzer Corps held up the Soviets for a significant amount of time. A Danish officer narrates the following. When the enemy artillery fire finally ceased on the whole line, we were treated with the surprise of the day. A Russian panzer formation with a couple of hundred tanks which faced towards our batteries. One must have experienced such a panzer attack to understand the effect it has. Our personnel was an experienced bunch. The infantry in the first ranks let the tanks roll over them and shot their panzerfausts at the weak rear of the tanks, and we sent a barrage against them. The attack lasted for five hours, and around two in the afternoon the situation looked dire, but all disposable manpower was scrambled for a counterattack against the Russian infantry, which had slipped forward with the panzers, and around 4 p.m. the Russians retreated. They left behind 72 tanks. The number of Soviet tanks destroyed may be exaggerated. Nevertheless, the Soviets continued their panzer attacks between the 26th and 27th of July, and the soldiers of Regiment Denmark kept repelling them. Although the Soviets suffered massive casualties, the soldiers from Regiment Denmark also suffered great casualties. The 3rd Battalion from Regiment Denmark 
was almost completely wiped out during the battles. Also the 2nd battalion lost a lot of good soldiers. Some of the fallen were now replaced with men from the previously mentioned SS Penal Division, who had helped build fortifications at the uranium bound pocket. Volunteers from Estonia and police soldiers were fitted into the ranks of Regiment Denmark. Also among the leading officers could Division Nordland mourn casualties. When the leading officer of Division Nordland, Fritz von Scholz, came to visit Regiment Denmark's artillery positions during the battles with the Soviets, the artillery positions suddenly came under threat of being destroyed by the advancing Soviet forces. Fritz von Scholz therefore decided to lead a counterattack in person. This counterattack would cost him his life. After the tough fighting on the Tannenberg line, the German troops once more had to retreat. To the south in Latvia, the Soviet forces were threatening to encircle the entire Herzkuppen north. This made the German high command empty Estonia of soldiers, despite the political and economical downsides such a decision might have brought. Worst case scenario would be if the Soviets managed to occupy the city of Riga. This would mean that the entire Herzkuppen north would be encircled. On the 17th of September, the German forces were forced to march south into Latvia, and already on the 22nd of September, they arrived and were ready to be sent into action around the city of Riga. In only four days, the entire division Nordland had marched 400 kilometers. With the newly arrived forces to Latvia, the Germans made a counterattack on the Soviet forces around Riga, denying the Soviets their encirclement. When Regiment Denmark was still fighting on the Tannenberg line in August, Per Sørensen would get himself tangled in on the fighting around Riga. He had been on military leave in Denmark and was passing through Riga when he was thrown into the fighting. The Germans were scrambling every soldier possible to help defend Riga. Despite the counteroffensive from the Germans in September, the Soviets would on the 10th of October reach the North Sea and the encirclement of the Baltic states and Herzkuppen North became a reality. Thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you in the next video. Have a nice day.